the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters of Christ, last week we touched upon the importance of preparing ourselves for the Divine Liturgy, of the need to prayerfully ready our hearts and quiet the noise in our life, to cultivate a spirit of repentance and desire to meet the Lord, so that we can really enter into the Liturgy as deeply as possible. And so having prepared ourselves, let's pick up today as we arrive at church. Think about that. As we drive in, we already sense that we've come to a different kind of place, a sacred place. We sense that from the moment we enter the church grounds. We see the cross out front, and the bells, and the icon stands outside, the beautiful flowers. And seeing this, the desire for God grows in our hearts. We sense with expectation what's to come with readiness what we're to participate in. As we enter the church, we make the sign of the cross, commending ourselves to the Holy Trinity, with the fear of God, with faith and love, as the words of the liturgy say. In the narthex, we may take a candle or two, but again, we enter the nave, the, the center of the church here, with reverently come forward to venerate the icons, quietly saying a prayer in our heart as we do so. We might say with the saints today, say, St. Peter, St. Silouan, pray to God for us, or Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. We feel that quiet joy and the strength of being in the presence of our friends here, our brothers and sisters in Christ. But we wait to enter into conversation. The time for fellowship will come. But now, like St. Peter once said, we recognize that it is good for us to be here together, and that is enough. Sometimes simply a nod or a handshake, a quiet greeting. Ideally, we've arrived before the liturgy has begun, and we work to quiet, to quiet our thoughts. Someone on the kleros is reading the, the prayers of the hours. We may join our, our, our thoughts to those prayers. We may also, at this time, pray to God for specific people in our life. Or we can pray about the difficulties we're facing. This time before liturgy begins is, is the perfect time for these kinds of prayers. As in fact, the same time that the priest in preparing for liturgy is remembering by name many people at the Prost Media. In fact, nearly all of you, unless you're, unless you're very new, will be on this uh, on the list of names that we remember each each liturgy as particles are removed and placed onto the Tidaran bread onto the patent. We can talk more about that another time. But very soon, very soon, once the liturgy begins, it'll be time to set aside all personal prayers, all individual thoughts as all those who we remember and all of our attention will be lifted up and offered unto God. We will see that image very powerful later on when it is lifted up the chalice and pat in thine own of thine own. We hear the bells begin to ring as if to say, let us attend, come and gather, prepare to meet the King, for he is coming. The bells call us to the kingdom of God which is at hand. And thus, the first blessing we hear, the words that begin the liturgy, announce both the goal and the reality. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. The kingdom of God is here. Father Alexander Schmemann, the great liturgist, explains as follows. As the divine liturgy begins with the psalm doxology, blessed is the kingdom. The Savior likewise began his ministry with the same words, with this proclamation of the kingdom, the bringing announcement, that, and we read from, from Mark's Gospel, that Jesus came into Galilee preaching the Gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the, the Gospel. For that great epistle as well today, that the time is fulfilled. Now is the acceptable time. The kingdom of God is the content of the center of the Christian faith, the goal, meaning, and content of Christian life. It is the knowledge of God the love for Him, unity with Him, and life in Him. It's precisely in worship as the Church that we both ascend to the Kingdom and we already experience it. To say it's both where we're going, but also what we already enter into, that we already experience. And every time, Father Spremley continues, that we assemble as the Church, we witness before the whole world that Christ is King and Lord, that His Kingdom has already been revealed and has been given to mankind, and that within it, a new and immortal life has begun. And when we, as the body of Christ, respond with the word, Amen, it signifies not just our agreement, but this act of confirmation and acceptance. It is a confession. 
this confession that yes, this too is the reality in my life. This is so and let it be so. And so with the Amen in the liturgy, we, we seal every prayer with our common affirmation like a bond and a seal. The same way with the petitions later, when we all say, Lord have mercy, or grant this, O Lord. We're, 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 we're joining all of our heart, our whole self, to these petitions, to these requests of our Lord, to these proclamations. And then for, for what, what continues from the outset of the liturgy as we, as we move into it, uh, two things become very clear from the beginning, from that great litany that we move into. And one is that we are called to two things. We're called to peace and to intercede. We're called to peace and to intercede. What is it we hear? We hear, in peace, let us pray to the Lord, seeking the peace of God, and understanding that in order to have this peace, we must strive to be at peace with all people. Remember this convicting words of the Apostle John who wrote, that he who says that he loves God and hates his brother is a liar. And indeed, we can't, sincere, we can't hate anyone that we sincerely pray for. This is something to think about here. We can't really hate somebody that we pray for. And so if we want to overcome any kind of hatred, any kind of dislike or enmity in our heart, the best thing that we can do is to add that person to our list of prayers, to pray for them. This is a very powerful thing on, on, the, grand, on the grandest level that we do in the, in the liturgy, beginning the Great Litany, is that we are immediately interceding for the whole world. For the whole world. We pray for peace in the world, that all enmity, hatred and strife, all wars would cease. We pray for the church throughout the world for its well-being. We pray for those who are separated in faith, that they may be united as one in Christ's holy church. We pray both globally and locally. We pray for our own community, for all, for all of you, for all of us who enter here. We pray for our bishops and clergy, for the president and all the civil authorities, just as the apostles Peter and Paul commanded us to do, whether or not they're Orthodox or even Christian, whether or not we agree with them or not. But as St. Paul said, we pray for them, we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all pure piety and purity. It was very clear that our prayer of the liturgy isn't just limited to Orthodox Christians or within the church, but it extends, it is a prayer for the whole world. And so we take upon ourselves, this is the amazing thing to think about, that we take upon, we join in the awesome duty of sharing in the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ, interceding on behalf of the whole world for its salvation. We pray for the travelers, those in captivity or in prison, for the sick and the suffering, and finally, remembering the Holy Virgin and all the saints who intercede for us and are a part of the worship here with us in the heavenly church. We commend ourselves and each other and all our life to Christ our God. Amen. We remind us today of one of the saints we commemorate, St. Silwan, and his personal prayers have really become that liturgical prayer. And it was most known for grant the merciful Lord that all people may come to know thee through thy Holy Spirit. And in a sense, it's, it's that, that prayer that lifting up the participation that we're called to in sharing in, in Christ's high priestly ministry at the liturgy. So, dear brothers and sisters, and as, we, <coughs> as we enter the church, as we enter the divine liturgy, we enter a place where time and eternity meet, where the separation between the living and the departed is very thin where we come together as the body of Christ, as the church, entering into this reality of the kingdom of God. A reality where the peace of the Holy Spirit reigns, and where we, together with Jesus Christ and his saints, intercede on behalf of and for the salvation of the world. Hold this in your hearts, dear brothers and sisters, and don't let any thoughts of what we have to do later, or what someone else is or isn't doing right, steal that peace of heart. But hold fast, to that great reality. For according to the Holy Fathers, nothing causes us to lose peace of heart so much as giving way to a spirit of, of judgment or condemnation. Whereas on the contrary, a spirit of repentance, the broken and contrite heart, re retracts the grace of the Holy Spirit. Everything that rejoices in the good, in the holy, in the beautiful, this brings the grace of the Spirit, Holy Spirit upon us and we experience that peace. So may we hold fast to this, Enter deeply into the prayers of the liturgy, interceding on behalf of all and for all, commending ourselves and each other and all our life to Christ our God, who will be all glory, honor, and worship, fathers, uh, together with His Father and all Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages.